great to be here with you guys this morning. Why don't we start off the day the right way by giving our neighbors a nice greeting with a hug or a handshake this morning. Amen. Yes. <coughs> absolutely, absolutely. So. Well, good morning again. I just want to say thank you to everybody who's here in this place today, everybody who's watching us online. Just thank you so much for joining us this morning. And uh, if you're a visitor with us, uh, let us know. If you're, it's the first time watching online, go ahead and drop us a, drop us a message in, uh, in the little uh, chat window or, uh, or, or email us, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Just thank you, uh, thank you again. I know that uh, coming into summer, God just has so many things changing and going on, and he wants to do so many amazing things in this place, and we just want to want this place to be inviting for him, and we just want him to know that he's welcome here. Amen with Amen. open arms Amen. and we love him so much and uh, we just want to sing of his praise this morning sing of his love sing of his grace you, and Jesus. will you guys go ahead and uh, enjoy me this morning however you'd like uh, and let's go ahead and sing our songs of praise to our lord amen, amen. amen.
Shout it out. That's right. <laughs> Glorious. All right. Uh, for those of you who are visiting today or new, we practice open communion here. That means if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, take the communion with us. Uh, if Everybody should have a little packet. If you don't, raise your hand and somebody will get one for you. Okay. Um, communion, I love the word, way words are put together. Communion comes from words, the prefix com, C-O-M, mean to go with. Union means all together. So every time we have communion, we're doing something that's to bring us all together. Sometimes people say, how come you guys have communion every week? If you're from a different church background, you might not do that. Well, we believe here that we should do it every week to remind us. You know, um, things can get between us and, and God. God's supposed to be our total focus. But things can get between us. I'll just share something that uh, I've been thinking about the last couple weeks. Um, were the devil to come into the church here in all of his non-gloriousness, big red object with horns smelling of sulfur and brimstone, and said, hey guys, come on outside, let's have some fun. Most of us would say, get out of here, no way. But things slip in between us and God very easily. For example, this would never happen to any of you, but it happened to me. I woke up one morning a couple weeks ago and I woke up early and I had a lot of energy and I thought, I'm gonna get up and read. We're studying Revelation in our Tuesday morning group. I'm gonna read a couple chapters and read the Wearsby book and I've got so much energy and that's just good. And I went out to my chair and there was the Bible ready to go. Well, you know, coffee goes good with the Bible. So I then proceeded to make some coffee and toast goes good with the Bible and coffee. And I can't really leave the kitchen like that. I better clean it up. And, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to leave a message for some office on the East Coast. I better do that now. All of those things were good things that needed to be done. But what was it doing? It was getting between me and the Bible and me and the Lord. Now, I know this would never happen to any of you, but I just... Just want to warn you about that. We always need to remember to come close to the Lord. And he left us a very easy way to remember that when he left the, the gift of the communion. So the night before he died, he gathered his disciples together. They had a Passover dinner in a room somewhere in Jerusalem. And uh, at the end of dinner, he took the bread took the bread and he broke it and he passed it around and he 
said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. Take and eat. Then he took, then he took the cup and he passed it around. And he said, this represents my blood, which will be shed for you. Take and drink. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. We need to be reminded often of that so that we keep God first. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for helping us recognize nice things that get in the way of putting you first. And Lord, we also ask at this time, we have time of offering. One of the things that happened of during COVID, we didn't pass the offering plate around, and it's been more on people's honesty and and their call. There's many ways to give. Um, it helps support the church, and I'll say to the to the people on on the cyber church, um, it's been very expensive to perfect our television message to you, your, our video message to you. So we remind you that you're welcome to be included in, in the offering too. You can send it to the church or drop it off or uh, you can even go online. Now all this is needed to keep the church going and we thank you for your offering and your time. Lord, uh, bless this group today. Bless the message of unity that is going to come from the pastor today. We just ask you to strengthen him, yes. have your Holy Spirit express through him yes. what we need to know yes. in our congregation. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I just invite you guys to join us as we continue in all of our worship service. And let's, uh, let's keep giving those praises to our Lord. Show us, show us your glory. 
I will. 
Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Oh. Peace. 
verses where where they were in the fire God but there was an extra an extra silhouette an extra frame frame of somebody there God and we're so grateful that that is you God a God that is with us when we feel like things are too much that we can't push forward that we'll never get to where we need to be but we can't forget through, through the tribulations, through the hardest times, through, through all the doubt, through all the fear and everything that this world throws at us that makes us feel sometimes, God, that we have a God that is with us every step and we shall not fear. Amen? Amen. Amen. For you are with us always, God, and we love you. This morning we give you all praise. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Sorry, Jason. Well, good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you again this morning as we take a chance to share with each other, not just from God's word, but from his mission this morning. The last couple of years um, have messed with my perceptions, if you want to know the truth. I don't even know exactly how we're going to explain it to future generations. We struggled with coming out of a pandemic several times. Uh, and just when we thought it was over, a new strain would reveal itself. It set us back so many times. It's ruined plans time and time again, right here in this building. I mean, we've had things ruined because of this, this pandemic. And we also had what can only be described as a contentious election cycle. And in that cycle, I have to admit that in my position as a minister, I was ashamed and embarrassed 
by the behavior and the language of a lot of high-profile Christian leaders and even some high-profile Christian pastors and authors, TV and radio personalities on both sides of the political aisle. But the ones that hurt me the most were the ones at the far right. Um, Now, I want to say right now, before we go any further in this, that I lean right in my own personal political feelings. And, 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 and those folks who were supposed to represent me um, and my ideals, well, that just much of what I heard just embarrassed me. And in many cases, it hurt my feelings for what I believe to be the true uh, cause of Christ. There's a famous author, there he is, you can see him in the picture there. Um, author and pastor Andy Stanley wrote a book about this phenomenon that I was feeling and many other people were feeling in the ministry and we didn't know quite how to voice our feelings and this book is called not in it to win it and we have things that we need to deal with as a church and when I say we I mean that I mean we because no matter where we fall in our behavior or our witness or our political leanings the Apostle Paul explained to us that we are all one body some are the hands some are the feet some are other important parts But the church is one body together and we support each other. But that also means that we have to try our best to answer for one another. Our nation is going to be gearing up for one more uh, election cycle and many more after that. And the next one's going to be described as crazy. There's just no other way around it. It's going to get politically crazy again whether we like it, whether I like it or not. Whether we prepared for it or not. So, if some of you enjoy that, some of you enjoy politics, you enjoy the spectacle, you enjoy the argument, and that's fine. It's, well, it's part of our national spectacle. It's a great thing that we have free speech. But that also means that that right gets really amped up in certain circles, in certain places. And even though free speech sometimes feels like it allows things to go too far, well, it's way better than the alternative, in my opinion. But as Christians, as Jesus followers, we have a specific responsibility that we can't ignore or we can't abandon, even though we all have widely held and strongly held political views. If you're a future version of yourself and you're looking back on this, you look back on your story from 2020 to 2021, wouldn't it be great if your story was one of faith and, and grace and forgiveness, of compassion, of giving, Not fear and panic and selfishness and divisiveness. This church, this building, this body of believers shut its doors while spending money to make sure that we had a successful online presence for people who still would have the opportunity to share and worship together so this body could still do that. We opened up when we could and when we thought it was safest. And still there were those out there, there are those out in the country that said, open your doors. Don't let the government or anyone else tell you what you should be doing in your own buildings. Christian leaders accused us and other churches of not having enough faith by closing our doors. When in reality, we were concerned uh, about our faith in our decisions. They would say, shut down when you should be standing up. They said that, you shut down when you should have been standing up. But in truth, we never really shut down. We just really wanted to be responsible and we wanted to be good neighbors. The hospitals were full. The issue really wasn't what do we think about COVID, the issue is what is our responsibility and our reputation in the community. And our reputation in the community matters to me, it matters to us because we're trying to reach and impact our community the best way that we possibly can. And another thing that we desperately, I have desperately tried to do is to avoid politicizing church. For the past two years, two plus years, people have been on me. They've been in my emails or they've shown up in my office or they've called me um, and they've admonished me for not taking a harder stance on certain issues. And I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure if we lost anybody here at C4 because of the decisions that we made as a leadership uh, during the pandemic. But I do know that the church throughout the country were accused in many instances to caving into the pressure from the government. Many people just didn't believe our stance. Some felt like it was still some sort of political posturing. 
Now, our mission is, is to love our neighbors, love our neighborhoods, as Jesus has given us very specific orders in this, right? In terms of our responsibility of the church. There's no hidden agenda in following Jesus' clearly stated plans. And here's a principle that I want to share with you this morning. When life is predictable, you know, when, when everything is going as it should, like you want it to, you know, we have some seasons like that. Some of us have been fortunate where everybody's relatively healthy and everyone has a job and everything just seems to be working out. It's easy to lose sight of what we value most, right? When things are going easy, when they're going good. I want you to hear that today, this morning. When everything seems great, it is so easy to lose sight of what we value most. It's also easy to lose sight of what we fear the most. So when a tsunami of uncertainty comes at us, it comes rolling in, then things get real in a hurry, don't they? Another thing you need to hear this morning is that uncertainty does not alter our value system. Uncertainty exposes our value system. In times of uncertainty, our reactions are what give us away, okay? Our actions don't tell the whole story. Now, you've all heard the phrase, right? Actions speak louder than words. Well, the reason that you've heard it is because it's true. <laughs> but our actions don't tell the whole story. Our reactions certainly do. Our reactions to things around us and certain circumstances tell our story. So many Christians' response to the political, social, and economic health crisis of, of I keep saying 19, of 2021 and, and 2020, exposed in many of our leaders and in ourselves what's, well, what's actually been true all along. Remember, this crisis didn't change our value system, right? It exposed it. And this is going to sound critical, but I have to be a little bit critical here because we're all part of the same body, the church collectively, and so it's our responsibility. Beneath some of that Bible-based rhetoric and all those faith claims, there's actually a bit of a hidden agenda. And it's an agenda that people outside of the church have suspected all along. You see, people all around us have thought that the people in the church, they suspected that we're just like them. That the same thing that drives them is what drives us as well. And the same thing that drives every single ideological movement drives the local church as well. And at the end of the day, their suspicion is, and unfortunately what too many Christian and Christian leaders tip their hat to is, what we value most is winning. What we value most is winning. And apparently, a lot of Christian leaders fear the same thing that every other ideology and every other group fears as well, and that's losing, all right? Losing influence, losing our voice, losing our rights. And here's the irony this morning, which is exactly what happens whenever the church abandons its Christ-ordained mandate. So we need to be careful. Whenever the church loses sight of our mandate as the local church, we do, in fact, lose our voice. We do, in fact, lose our influence. We do, in fact, lose the ultimate opportunity, which should be, should be to be the conscience of our nation. So whenever the local church stoops to and reduces itself to the kingdoms of this world's aspirations, which is to win at all costs and to have our way and to protect our rights and to just become like every other political group, another party, another constituency, whenever the body of Christ in general or the local church loses sight of its Christ-ordained mandate, we in fact become a self-fulfilling prophecy. See, we lose the very things that so many Christians feel like we need to, to fight in order to maintain. I want to say this, and I mean it. We're not here to win anything. The church isn't here to win anything. Yes, be careful with the language here. We are, there in a sense, we are here to win hearts and souls, and we're definitely going to talk about that this week and next week, okay? But we're not here to win culture wars, and we're certainly not here to win elections. In 2021, church leaders, and this happened on both sides of the aisle, the left and the right, and this is the part that still doesn't make any sense to me if we think about it. Churches alienated half of the souls in America. Now, if we're all about reaching people, if the church is about reaching souls for Jesus, churches on the left and churches on the right alienated half the souls in America through their unchristlike behavior and rhetoric and politically based fear posturing. 
Many pastors on the right got extremely political and they demonized Democrats. Pastors on the left demonized everyone on the right. The Christians and the, the, the many uh, pastors occupied that right. And some serious questions needed to be answered. Hey, hey guys, way out there on the right, you think that most of the Democrats are lost and they're going to hell. Okay, well, doesn't that make them the mission field, right? I mean, everything that we're doing in the church says we want to reach people for Christ, but you don't come. And when we wander over to the left and say, wait a minute, you think all the people on the right aren't truly God followers and they're not really following Jesus and they're just playing a game and they are lost and going to hell. Well, aren't they the mission field? We are alienating half the people in America because of political views and we are abandoning what Jesus has called the church to do and what he called the church to be. And we're so divided. But the one thing, and this is key, the one thing that Jesus was most concerned about when it came to the future of the church that he knew his people would be building, okay? It wasn't their theology, it wasn't their music, it wasn't their baptism methods or how often they take communion. You know what number one thought was in Jesus' mind? Unity. Jesus said the unity of my people is ultimately the essence of the message of people believing that I was actually sent from God. Well, <laughs> so the last couple of years, I feel like the church in general has missed an unprecedented opportunity to live and react in contrast to what's happening in the world around us. All of us, to some extent, are probably a little guilty of this, me too. Too many of us did exactly what the Apostle Paul warned first century believers not to do, are you ready for this? <laughs> if you think this is unrealistic for us, what I'm about to say to you, what I'm about to show you, I can't even imagine how unrealistic it would have been and sounded in the first century, okay? This is Philippians chapter two, verse 14. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. Woo! Wait a minute. No, 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 wait. That's un-American, right? <laughs> grumbling and arguing, that's how you know I'm an American. How unpatriotic is that garbage? And the assumption behind this statement is that there was something to grumble and argue about. Come on, Paul, why not argue and grumble? Why not demand to get our way? Where is the win in that? And Paul says, I'm glad you asked. Verse 15, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Hmm. Now, we've probably all said or thought this at one time or another in our lives. Oh, my goodness, what is happening in my country? We are going this way and we're going that way. And you think, oh, no. Are, are we the crooked generation <laughs> that Paul was talking about here? Is it, is it us? And Paul says, if you're worried about that, hey, church, I've got some good news for you. You have the potential to make all the difference in your warped and crooked generation but you're not gonna make a difference by grumbling and arguing with everybody around you. And then Paul follows it up with this, and let's reiterate that this sounds crazy to me, sounds crazy to us right now, but it would've been much crazier in the first century. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. The contrast between you and other people would be so apparent, so evident, that people will stop and stare. Well, thanks to the last two and a half years, the church has lost some of its shine. Christians, we've lost some of our shine. And we desperately need to get it back. We need to try and fix this, and it's not gonna be easy, but it's, it's not complicated, because we have to stop arguing and grumbling with one another. And in 2021, we did that. We did it well. <laughs> we argued and grumbled with state and local authorities sometimes with our own neighbors, even with our pastors. We heard it. And here's what's being reported by pastors all over the country. This is true. The people aren't mad at us for what we're doing. They're mad about what I'm not doing, what I've never done, and what I don't plan to ever do. But it's our duty as pastors to lead, uh, to lead our way towards Jesus no matter what the cost is. Jesus says in, in Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Oh, man, that sounds great. But instead, 
Many churches went to war with state and local governments over the right to meet shoulder to shoulder in recirculated air during a pandemic. Now, not every church did this. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, churches all over the country chose to handle this thing differently in different ways in this season, but there is a problem, and it is sad. They left, don't miss this this morning, okay? They left the impression with the rest of the world that the church would suffer irreversible harm if we can't meet sitting right next to each other every seven days. We just won't survive. Do you realize how fragile that makes the church of our king sound? Think back to, to when the church began, okay? Think to what is happening to the church in other countries even today. And here's another embarrassing part for me, okay? The cries came out, we're losing our religious liberty and Christians in other countries are saying, no, you're not. Let me show you what the loss of religious liberty looks like. Come spend a month with me, all right? Missionaries all over the world are saying, no, you're not. And while large parts of the church are crying out, oh no, the end is near, we're left looking incredibly weak and fragile. Jesus was clear. He said, I'm going to establish my church and the gates of hell are not going to be able to shut it down. Rome didn't shut it down. The Jewish temple couldn't shut it down. Communism couldn't kill it. The church is not fragile, so stop freaking out, America. Watching Christians that I know, pastors, some of them famous, criticizing and demonizing people that they've never met, people that they will never have access to. This is Christianity 101, guys. We gave up the moral high ground. We did. We confirmed what some of our kids and the next generation have suspected about us, that perhaps, perhaps we don't actually believe what we claim to believe. Demonizing others in another political party has become sort of an exercise in virtue for many people. Now, if you're not a Christian, well, you're arguing, have at it, okay? There are no rules for you in this area if you're not a Christian. This has nothing to do with you. They're going to do whatever they want. But if you are a Jesus follower or a leader, and you have a responsibility for the spiritual development for other people, then we have no business participating in any of that noise. Even if you're convinced that you're right. Even if you know that you're right. Jesus spoke to these matters and issues. I hear cries like, we're standing up for the truth and we are not going to be intimidated and we're demanding our religious rights. Don't I look like a two-year-old? We're in it to win it. Now, as a man, as an American, as a human being, that sounds pretty good to me. Actually, I got to tell you, we're going to win. We're going to We're gonna fight the good fight. We're gonna stand our ground. We're gonna argue. It all sounds good. (laughs) Until you follow Jesus through the gospels. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Or even follow the apostle Paul from Greece to Jerusalem to Rome. Uh Uh-oh. So as un-American as it sounds and as pathetic as it sounds to some people, as passive as it sounds, the church is not here to win. Now, I want you to think about this and hear me clearly on this. By every human measure, let me say that again. By every human measure, Jesus didn't win. He lost. He lost on purpose. He lost for a purpose. And we, we are his body. So like our Savior, if you are a Jesus follower, then you are different. Jesus says, anybody who hears these words of mine, ah, oh, that's interesting, right? That's, that's a nice thought. Anybody who hears but does not do them is like somebody who built their house on the sand. You guys know that old story. The difference is made in the doing of what Jesus said. And that's why Jesus said, I want you to let your light shine in a way so that people will see that there's something different about you. They will see your good works and you will shine. So like Jesus We're not in this to win anything. We're in this for something else entirely. When we allow our faith to be subjugated to a political party of of your choice, whichever, when we allow our faith to be co-opted by our political party of choice, we lose our voice. 
And we don't just lose our voice, we, we lose our very direct distinction. We, we lose our way. We lose our opportunity to be the thing that we've been assigned to do, to be the conscience of our nation. Which means that the country that we love, when we get this wrong, the country suffers. Jesus didn't come to win the way that we define a win. He came to lose. And he invited us to follow him in a different win. Okay? And Paul understood this. The Jesus followers in Antioch, they were called Christians like we would call somebody a bad name. Okay? This was not a popular title. They were accused. Christian was an accusation of being Christians. That would be an honorable thing for me to be called today. That sounds awesome. But they were being accused of it. And the reason they were accused is because they were so, it was so evident that what they were doing is they were not following Caesar and they were not following the governor. They were partisans of a different king. They understood it and Peter understood it. And from that, the gospel changed the world. It is historically undeniable. The gospel changes communities, it changes families, it changes cultures, and most of us would say, it changed my life. Now, I want you to hear that I'm not advocating here for the withdrawal from the political process. I think what I'm saying here is the opposite. We should get involved. We should all vote. That's a stewardship of opportunity. We aren't ruled by Caesar in what we do, are we? Anytime we have the opportunity to vote your Christ-informed conscience, then you should vote. Lean into the process, get involved. The reason that we can't afford to withdraw is because we've been called to love and to care for our people, for our communities. So we need to do all we can to create a culture that's fueled by the love and the care of God as we love and care in his name. Now, for those of you who are thinking, wait a minute, you're, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth here. <laughs> There's a line of demarcation that I wanna make clear, all right? I wanna clear up that misconception right now. We should be very involved because we're extremely grateful for our nation. But our posture, our tone, and our approach must reflect our Lord. These are three things that have been prescribed to us by him. You have the freedom to choose whether or not to follow Jesus. All of us do. But you don't get to choose what following Jesus looks like. What it sounds like, what it acts like, what it reacts because that's been prescribed to us for Jesus' followers. The instructions are on the label, okay? Paul writes in his letter to the church in Corinth, and he describes what he think, uh, thinks a win is, all right? He uses the term win. But he explains that there is a win, but not in the way that the world understands for it to be a win. And Paul shares his strategy for winning. Because deep down inside, Paul is a church planter, right? He goes into hostile pagan cultures and, and, and he isn't just talking about Jesus. He asks them to abandon their entire lives. Not their religion, but their entire worldview. So he's inviting Gentiles to think differently about everything and everybody. So here's his strategy, and it's so lame, right? It's so lame and passive that it couldn't possibly work. His lame ideas, along with Jesus' lame ideas, um, Ones that could not possibly work shaped Western civilization. It's why every woman with a car should have a bumper sticker that says, I love Jesus, even if they're not a Christian, because whether you're a Christian or not, Jesus elevated the dignity of every single woman, every single person, every child. He shaped Western civilization. And how did he do it? Well, he didn't do it the way I'd be tempted to go about it. He was not interested in the kingdoms of this world. He only cares about the kingdoms of God and he has invited us to follow. So Paul's approach, it can be disturbing. Remember, this is this important detail. It worked, all right? So 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone. Now we see this word and, and many times we think of it figuratively. But we have to remember that he's writing in a time that the entire economy of the world rose and fell on the amount of slaves and the ability of slaves to function and the ability to purchase slaves. And when Paul wrote this, every single person, with the exception of a few elite, 
all right, except for just a handful of people, was potentially someone's slave. This was not ethnic slavery. It was poverty or economic slavery. The kind of my husband died slavery the, or the crops didn't come in slavery. Almost everyone had the potential to become a slave. So Paul's words here hit somewhere closer that was a really big deal at the time. In fact, Paul's grandparents were probably saved, uh, slaves that had been set free. But in this case, he chose the wording, I have made myself a slave. Now wait just a minute. To everyone? You said to everyone there. You mean even, even people who, who you don't like? Paul says, especially the people I don't like. Well, wait, 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 wait. Even the people that disagree with you. And Paul says, especially the people that disagree with me. You see, because in his great wisdom, he decided to place himself under, to serve under, to go second. But he had an agenda, all right? He had this other's first strategy in mind and an agenda that had been given to him by the king. And here's the agenda, verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. There's the win. I mean, that's the win that Paul's describing here. I am into winning, all right? I'm into winning as many people as possible. And again, his goal, it's impossible, was to win people away from generationally ingrained worldviews to a new way of seeing everything and everybody. How naive, how pathetic. What kind of strategy is that? Let's get this straight because this is never gonna work, Paul. You're gonna submit to and serve people as a way of influencing people? Paul, come on, buddy. That is never gonna work. You cannot influence people by serving them and placing yourself under them. That's not gonna work for you, and it didn't work for Jesus. So Paul continues, verse 20, to the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. You think to yourself, but Paul, you're a Jew. He was a Jew, but not necessarily to himself, not in this place and culture. Here's why. In the first century, he wouldn't have been seen as a Jew. In fact, in the first century, he was a Hebrew from Tarsus. See, in the first century, Jesus was called a Galilean, okay? In the first century, if you lived in Judea, you were a Judean or a Jew. So what Paul is saying is, I've become, even though I'm from Tarsus, even though I was raised in a different culture, Paul moved to Judea and blended in with the Judeans who ran the temple and he learned how to play the game with them. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. He says, I'll do it. I'm going to shape myself to influence them. Verse 21. To those not having the law, I've become like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. And that's where his story intersects with your story and with my story. I am under Christ's law. I'm under the law of the king, God's final king, right? And if you consider yourself a Christian, you are accountable to the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is very simple. You don't have to write this down. There's not 10 of them. <laughs> There's only one. One you really need to remember. You are to love one another as God through Christ has loved you. You are to love people around you the way that God through Christ loved you and me. That's it. That's the law of Christ. Paul says, as I make my way into all these different cultures, all these different people, in order to win them over to a new way of seeing the world, I am under the law of God. I am under Christ's law. And here is why that is so important. Christ's law will determine my tone, my posture, and my approach. Those three things we said earlier. To love as Christ loved me will determine my tone, posture, and approach. And I'm going to love you as you love me regardless of your political views or anything else. But why, Paul? So as to win those not having the law. Come on, Paul, make up your mind, would you? You're just waffling around a little bit here, aren't you? Whoever you're with, you just, you just become a chameleon and blend in. Take a stand, Paul, does that sound familiar? Take a position, you can't stand in the middle. 
The Bible says, be hot or be cold. Don't be lukewarm, Paul. And those are the kind of things that many people threw at church leaders in 2020 and 2021. Take a stand, Clint. I'm going to tell you the truth. I stand here with Paul. People ask if you're not taking a stand, are you afraid of losing followers on Twitter? <laughs> or are you afraid of losing your job? Or whatever it might be. No. I would not choose my position if that were my concern. It would be easier to shout from the extremes. No, this place where I'm occupying can be a lonely place. It's lonely in the middle. In this climate, there's nobody that likes you. <laughs> if I was worried about all that other stuff, this is not where I would land. I can get attacked by both sides. So my, and, and in some ways, our leader's refusal to take a political stand has been viewed by many as not taking any kind of stand. But we have taken one. It's really simple. We are not going to politicize the body of Christ or his church. We're standing for the posture and tone and approach prescribed to us by our king. We're standing against alienating half the people in our country by siding with one political party over another. We stand with Jesus in the lonely messy middle we won't fall victim to divisive broad brushed political talking points and what Paul writes next is one of the best things in the whole New Testament and I would love to say that this informs everything that I do as a Christian leader that our church does this as a beacon to our community but this is Paul's mission and strategy statement I have become all things to all people now don't miss this Paul's saying that I've learned to build and navigate relationships with people that I have virtually nothing in common with. But why, Paul? Why? I mean, that is so much trouble. <laughs> it's just so much easier to go and find my space and surround myself with people who look like me and, and live like me. Why go to all this effort? Here it is, Paul says, so that by all possible means, that means whatever it takes, including being misunderstood, including being left out, and in Paul's case, including being mistreated. And he lays out his mission, his great commission informed mission, that I might save some. You know, it's truly amazing that anything that the Apostle Paul wrote survived the first century. But you know why it did? It survived because he refused to bend to the prevailing worldviews of his day. He was convinced, as we are, that God had done something new in the world for the world. And it was so new that he was not gonna let it be co-opted. It was so new it didn't fit into current, any current existing political bucket. And in spite of everything going on in the world, he was convinced that he held the moral high ground, the ethical high ground. He didn't feel compelled to win something because Jesus had already won. Which in turn means the world had already won. Here's how Paul wraps this up, verse 23. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. So why do we, why don't we as a church just keep on doing that? Why don't we just keep on doing what it says right there? Because when a church group or a group of churches becomes preoccupied with saving America, it's forsaken its mission. When a church becomes preoccupied by defending its own rights rather than the advocating for the rights of other people, we've lost our way. The church always looks better when we are advocating for other people's rights rather than our own. Team, you can come up. I'm about ready to start wrapping up. Famous pastor and author Tim Keller from New York City makes this great statement. When the church as a whole is no longer seen as speaking to questions that transcend politics, and when it's no longer united by common faith that transcends politics, then the world sees strong evidence that Nietzsche and Freud and Marx were all right. That religion is just a cover for people wanting to get their own way in the world. Isn't that really how your unchurched friends and family members see the church? Isn't it just another ideology? Just another movement? They just want their way in the world. They're just leveraging the Jesus in the Bible to get their way in the world. Well, the truth is when the church is divided, when we're at each other, when we allow ourselves to be subjugated by any other issue or any other thing other than the gospel, it looks as if we're just leveraging our religion in order to cover ourselves 
and to get our own way in the world. So let's resist that temptation. Let's decide that we're not going to do that. Let's just keep deciding that we're not going to do those sort of things. Every time you place your hand over your heart to say the Pledge of Allegiance, you advocate for what we're talking about here. One nation under God. God first. Our king first. Because our ultimate allegiance is to the king. And here's the thing. You know this because you've experienced it, whether you've had words to put around it or not. Our uncompromising devotion to our much better king will ultimately make America a better place. It'll ultimately make this world a safer place. Our uncompromising devotion to our better king will make America a better nation. And we know that. Not because we're projecting into the future, but because that is exactly what history has taught us. Next week, we're going to talk about specifically about us and specifically what's next. So I encourage you to come back for part two for not in it to win it. We're coming into our invitation time. Um, if you need prayer this week, God's speaking something into your heart. If you have a decision you need to make for Christ, this is the time to do that. We're going to have a couple of leaders, Jim and, and Lourdes, are going to be up here to, to pray with you. Just invite you to really think about what God has in store for you, for our country, as these times, these things are not going away. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much. We, we're blessed by, by the words of other men, by the Apostle Paul, by the example he set for, for the mandate that Jesus gave us, God. We just pray that we would keep those things focused on you. We love you so much, Lord, and we just pray that you'd continue to work in our hearts as we figure out the best ways to represent you in your kingdom to make a difference for our communities and for the people around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Everybody falls sometimes You gotta find the strength to rise from the ashes and make a new beginning anyone can feel the ache you think it's more than you can take but you're stronger you're stronger than you know but don't you give up now the sun will soon be shining you gotta face the clouds to find the silver lining and i've seen dreams that move the mountains hope that doesn't ever end even when the sky is falling i've seen miracles just happen Broken hearts become brand new That's what faith can do It doesn't matter what you've heard Impossible is not a word It's just a reason For someone not to try and everybody's scared to death When they decide to take that step Out on the water But it'll be alright Cause life is so much more Than what your eyes are seeing You will find your way If you keep believing
shows us around every corner what the grain of faith the size of a mustard seed can do, God. God, just that little amount can move mountains, God, and we love you and we give you praise. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I have just a few announcements. Uh, this one day, our kids, uh, K through fifth grade, uh, are going to the West Coast Game Park. That'll be awesome. We will meet here at 10 a.m., so bring a sack lunch and a $17 admission f for admission. Uh, today is the last day to sign up for the Whitewater Jet Boat Trip on July 30th. Um, if you would like to go, please stop by the Welcome Center after service today. And for more upcoming events, uh, please go to cokefieldchristian.com slash events. And with that, we're going to go ahead and sing one last song to our, our Lord, and let's have a great day with our families. You called me out of the grave, you called me into the light, you called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Church, have a great day.